We go to the second speaker, which is uh, Dr. Tatiana Stanova, uh, who is a head of innate and tumor immunology at the Garvan Institute in Sydney. So it's another Australian today. Uh, so after undergrads at the, uh, the New South Wales in Australia, Tatiana moved to Garvan Institute where she got a PhD and uh, uh, on a T cell subset. Um, then she moved to US at University of California, Berkeley for a postdoc. And there she kind of got introduced to the intravital microscopy to photon in vivo imaging, uh, uh, what, what she applied to uncover the unique neutrophil response of inflammation, which is called neutrophil swarming, uh, and the novel mechanism of immune invasion by pathogens. And then she returned to, to Garvan Institute in 2009, where she established her own team. And uh, she's interested in immune cell migration and in function both in cancer as in infections. And please, can you... Tatiana, can you, can you uh, share your screen with us? Yes, um, thank you, Daniela, and thank you, organizers, for inviting me. It's very nice to be able to connect to people during these times. And um, I have to say, Felicity is a hard app to follow, so I'm feeling slightly intimidated, but all I can say is my cells move fast. Um, so, well, hello, my name is Tatiana, and I'm an immunologist. If you hang around immunologists long enough, you probably will realize that most of us have a favorite immune cell type, and we think that cell is the most important cell in the whole field of immunology. So for me, this cell is the neutrophil. But you might be surprised to learn that not all immunologists agree with my opinion. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble moving my slides. I'm maybe in the wrong speaker view. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I don't know what I did, but it seems to be working. So when I looked at the program for the main immunological society in Australia, I found that most um, talks in our annual meeting actually focused on T cells, with um, other immune cells like B cells and macrophages getting some attention and also dendritic cells. But what about neutrophils? I could find only two talks in the whole meeting that were focused on neutrophils. So does that mean that neutrophils are not important? Well, that is definitely not the case, because to put it simply, if you don't have neutrophils, you will die of infection. So neutrophils are an absolutely vital first line of defense against bacteria. They also protect us um, during sterile injuries and um, have a major role to play in chronic inflammation and homeostasis. The way they mediate their functions is through direct pathogen killing through phagocytosis. They release a lot of um, matrix remodeling enzymes that help them undo, um, help them carry out tissue remodeling on a large scale. And they also have a very important function in immune regulation. So why is it that neutrophils receive relatively little attention among immunologists? Well, one of the main reasons that neutrophils are considered to be very short-lived cells that are recruited to the site of inflammation, try to get rid of bacteria, and then die at the site of inflammation. They are also a very hard cell to study. Neutrophils do not proliferate in vitro or in vivo. They are easily activated during isolation, so that means that ex vivo manipulation of neutrophils is very difficult. They don't survive well in culture. So what all of that means is that to study neutrophil requires in vivo approaches. Fortunately, intravital microscopy is perfect to study neutrophils in their native microenvironment. I first um, became interested in neutrophils during my postdoc in Ellen Roby's lab at UC Berkeley. Now, funnily enough, um, at that time, we were not interested in neutrophils and were actually looking at the immune response to an intra obligate intracellular parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. And we were trying to find macrophages, but luckily for us, the reporter mouse that we were using actually was much better at reporting neutrophils. So the green blobs you see in this video are actually neutrophils responding to the little red Toxoplasma gondii parasite in the draining lymph node of a mouse. And what you can see here is this unique neutrophil behavior called swarming, where neutrophils seem to rapidly converge at a particular site in, in these dynamic swarms. Now, this was discovered by us um, 13 years ago, and to this day, we still don't quite understand the significance of neutrophil swarming. 
Although one major theory is that by getting together, neutrophils release a lot of inflammatory mediators and tissue remodeling factors that allow them to quickly capture pathogens before they have a chance to spread. So when I came back to Australia, oh, sorry, one more um, example of how neutrophils destroy pathogens. So in red, you have cells um, infected with Toxoplasma gondii, and in green, you have neutrophils. And as you can see here, the cell in the oval is infected with multiple parasites. And you can see neutrophils converge on this cell and literally tear it into pieces. So that's how we think neutrophils destroy pathogens using um, by neutrophil swarms. Another important function of neutrophils is that they carry out large scale tissue remodeling. And this is what it looks like. So what we have here is a mouse ear. This is intravital imaging of a live mouse under anesthesia. In blue, you can see collagen in the mouse ear and green cells are neutrophils. We induce a small laser injury and then we observe what happens. So this is the formation of a neutrophil swarm at the site of inflammation. But if you focus on what happens to collagen, you can see the power of neutrophils in tissue remodeling. Here in this um, movie on the right, you can see how all these neutrophils are able to exert a vast amount of force and tissue modeling properties to quickly rearrange collagen on a relatively large scale. So this just exemplifies how powerful this cell can be during an immune response. So this slide summarizes about five years of work. And what we did here was um, use a combination of intravital microscopy and in vivo photoconversion to look at the role of neutrophils in responses to sterile and infectious inflammation. And we found that one of the main differences is that while neutrophils are rapidly recruited to sites of both infectious and sterile inflammation, when they're recruited to infectious inflammation, a proportion of these neutrophils that get, can get into the lymphatic vessels at the site of inflammation and travel into the draining lymph nodes. So not only do these neutrophils not die at the site of inflammation, but they travel into the draining lymph nodes and the effect of that is that they can also carry pathogen with, pathogens with them. And the reason why this is important is because it helps them mediate an important function and that is the initiation of the adaptive immune response. So neutrophils can travel from the site of inflammation and carry antigens and pathogens that, that then signal to the adaptive immune system about the ongoing infection. And this action of neutrophils can initiate the adaptive immune response in the drain lymph nodes. So this suggests that the role of neutrophils extends beyond the site of inflammation and they play an important um, role in regulating adaptive immune responses. But what do neutrophils do in cancer? So Neutrophils are present in most solid tumors, and they're usually considered to be part of the myeloid drug suppressor cell in the tumor po immune population. That means they have immunosuppressive functions that are usually considered to be pro-tumor functions. They also contribute to angiogenesis, which helps tumors metastasize. Another function of neutrophils is to release some neutrophil extracellular traps, which also help tumor cells to establish niches away from the primary tumor site. So due to these pro-tumor functions of neutrophils, current strategies that aim to um, harness the cell in tumor treatment are aimed at eliminating neutrophils or at least preventing their migration to tumors. However, this strategy has some serious side effects. Since neutrophils are really essential, and with, um, in the absence of neutrophils, you're exposed to life-threatening infections and are also hard to deplete, eliminating neutrophils is not a good strategy for treating cancer. It's interesting to know that neutrophils also have anti-tumor functions. They can directly kill tumor cells, they can stimulate anti-tumor response, and interestingly enough, they can also be anti-angiogenic. Interestingly, neutrophils can be switched by changing the factors in, in their microenvironment. For example, by blocking TGF beta, you can switch neutrophils pro, from pro to anti tumor ejector cells. So, we wondered is it possible to modulate neutrophil function in cancer? 
As I mentioned before, neutrophil function is shaped by their microenvironment. And one way to activate neutrophils is to stimulate them as if you would in infection. So this is what we decided to do. The connection between infection and cancer has been known for a long time. Back in 1891, um, a bone surgeon, William Cawley, first started injecting streptococcus bacteria into people with cancer. And he noticed that in several cases, the tumors went away. Injecting bacteria into cells is also one of the most successful immunotherapies to date. When BCG is used um, for a surgery in bladder cancer, it can prevent recurrence in up to 60% of superficial bladder cancers. So this provides evidence that microbial therapy can be an effective treatment in cancer. However, you may realize that microbial therapy is not a very widespread therapy. So we decided to investigate what are the mechanisms the cellular mechanisms of microbial therapy and what are the potential limitations of this approach. So, as I mentioned, neutrophils need to be studied in vivo. We developed an approach that allows us to study neutrophils in vivo using both intravital imaging and in situ labeling without the use of surgery. But we did have to use a few tricks. So, in our setup, we use syngenetic tumors that are injected into the ear pinna of um, reporter mice. So by growing tumors in mouse ears, we are able to see through the skin in the ear and image tumor without requiring surgery or any manipulation of mice. So we can image repeatedly over several days and um, several time points. So that provides a really good system for visualizing neutrophils in vivo. So not surprisingly, when you inject bacteria into a tumor, what you get is a huge influx of cells, of immune cells. And most of those immune cells happen to be neutrophils. This is what neutrophils do. They respond to infection. So if you put an infection into a tumor, neutrophils will respond really well. This is what it looks like intravitally. So what you have on the left is a control unmanipulated tumor. We are not visualizing tumor cells just yet, so blue is collagen and red is neutrophils. What you can see here is that there are several neutrophils in this tumor, but their migration is very different to what you've seen of neutrophils responding to toxoplasma gondii. They're relatively slow, almost sessile cells, which is very unusual for neutrophils and inflammation. But look how it changes when you add bacteria. Not only do you get a vast number of neutrophils recorded into the tumor, but their migration also changes quite dramatically. Although we haven't seen neutrophils swarm within the tumor microenvironment, you can see that their speed increases. Now, this change in neutrophil motility from slow, um, almost stationary cells to rapidly migrating, very excited looking cells, suggests that neutrophils are undergoing activation. So when we look at neutrophil phenotype by flow cytometry, we do indeed see an increase in neutrophil activation. You don't really need to know neutrophil activation markers, but CD11, upregulation of CD11B and concurrent downregulation of migration molecules CD62L and CXCO2 is a phenotype of characteristic of neutrophil activation in infection. So by putting a microbial stimulus into tumor, we were able to achieve neutrophil activation that looks somewhat similar to the type of activation neutrophils undergo in response to infection and a normal immune response. What was also interesting is that we saw a switch in neutrophil function. So in unmanipulated tumors, neutrophils produce a large amount of VEGF, but that is down-regulated upon stimulation with staphorase. Now, VEGF is one of the main pro-angiogenic factors that neutrophils produce in cancer. So we have a down-regulation in a pro-tumor factor, and a concomitant increase in INOS. Now, INOS is something that neutrophils use to produce reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species is what neutrophils release to kill pathogens and um, mediate tissue remodeling. So this video is just to remind you of these two videos what tissue remodeling by neutrophils looks like. 
So when you get a lot of neutrals together, what they can do is carry out with some fairly large um, scale tissue remodeling. When, that's only possible when there are lots of neutrals getting together. So we're wondering if we're getting an increase in iron loss, and this is what neutrals can do in inflammation, is this something that's going on in tumors as well? In order to test this hypothesis, we um, had to study neutral interactions with tumor cells in vivo. So in this case, we started to visualize tumor cells by um, introducing a fluorescent reporter. So this is a Lewis lung carcinoma tumor, blue is collagen, and green is tumor cells, red is neutrophils. This tumor has been treated with staphylococcus for 24 hours. And you can see there is a massive influx of neutrophils into this tumor. And what you can see when you switch off the neutrophil signal is where there are neutrophils, tumor cells seem to disappear. So this suggested to us that perhaps microbially activated neutrophils can carry out tissue remodeling within tumors in a similar way that they do in infection and other types of inflammation. To look at this more closely, we um, used intravital microscopy within these tumors. So in the first part of this video, what you can see is an unmanipulated tumor. The tumor cells are in green and you can see they have this um, typical elongated um, appearance. There are a few neutrophils that are moving around and this now switch to a staphorous tumor. So there are quite a few obvious differences. First of all, you can see that there is a massive influx in neutrophils that we have observed before. But hopefully you can also see that the tumor cells are now different. So some of them are still intact and elongated, but you also have a large number of um, cells that are becoming smaller and more rounded. And on the right side of the movie, you can see something that my, my lab has termed the tumor fog. So this looks like um, tumor cell debris. And in the middle, you have kind of a front that in intact tumor cells and invading neutrophils. So it really looks like neutrophils are undertaking tissue remodeling within tumors when they're activated by microbes. We decided to zoom in on this a bit closer and have a look at the interactions between individual neutrophils and tumor cells. And this is what it looks like. I have two examples where you can see individual neutrophils attacking tumor cells. And what you can see is that when neutrophils interact with tumor cells, tumor cells seem to undergo this blebbing, which is characteristic of cell death. And this is another example of this. Process. So if you watch the tumor cell here being attacked by several neutrophils, you can see that during this movie, um, it is virtually being um, torn apart by neutrophils. So what does this influx of activated neutrophils mean for tumor growth? When you treat the tumors with staphylococcus bioparticles, you can efficiently inhibit tumor growth. And this is true in several different models of syngenetic tumors that we have tried. We've looked at Lewis lung carcinoma, B16 melanoma, and also model of breast cancer. So in each case, stimulation of tumor with staphylococcus efficiently inhibits tumor growth. Next, we showed that this effect is actually neutrophil dependent. By depleting neutrophils, and at the same time treating tumors with microbial bioparticles, staphylococcus in this case, but can com completely abolish the effect of microbial treatment on tumor growth. So neutrophils are essential for mediating the anti-tumor effect of microbial therapy. The anti-tumor um, anti effect of microbial therapy is not restricted to a particular bacteria. We can also get similar tumor inhibition by using the BCG vaccine which is some um, good news for applying it um, for expediting clinical translation of this approach. However, it's um, not all good news. We found that for microbial therapy to work efficiently in inhibiting tumor growth in these models, neutrophil activation needs to be sustained. We'll lose the tumor growth inhibitory effect if we stop treatment of tumor with um, microbial bioparticles 
And we also lose this effect if we don't um, stimulate neutrophils repeatedly at um, frequent intervals. And we think this happens because if you look at a single injection of bacteria into tumor and see what happens to neutrophils, neutrophil numbers in tumors go up dramatically, and then that number is sustained after a single injection. But what is different is that neutrophil activation decreases. So that suggests that neutrophils can be activated very efficiently by microbial bioparticles in tumors. But this activation is not sustained because in addition to the activating signals coming from bacteria, you also have the suppressive signals from the tumor microenvironment. And as soon as the balance shifts from activating signals to the suppressive signals, neutrophils lose their anti-tumor phenotype and microbial therapy stops being effective. So this may explain why so far microbial therapy in clinic has not been very effective. So in summary, what we have shown here is that neutrophils are key mediators of anti-tumor effects of microbial therapy. Tumor remodeling by neutrophils is one of the key mechanisms of tumor growth inhibition in this approach. And what we think happens is that when you introduce bacteria into the tumor microenvironment, this redirects neutrophil functions from pro-cancer to the antipathogen program and it directs with antipathogen capabilities against tumor cells. But what we have also found is that um, neutrophil activation needs to be sustained in order to maintain this anti-tumor effect. And this could be important because a lot of therapies, um, such as chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery, cause, cause massive neutrophil recruitment into tumors. So what happens to these recruited neutrophils can be important to the outcome of, and the success of these therapies. And also, my, as I mentioned, microbial therapy has shown great promise, but it hasn't been, apart from a couple of stunning examples, such as the BCG treatment in bladder cancer, it hasn't been very successful in clinic as a monotherapy. And this may be because most microbial therapies are designed to activate dendritic cells and also macrophages. And little attention is paid to what happens to neutrophils and how they activate and how their function might be switched by that treatment. So it is important to take neutrophil functions into account when de developing new therapies, especially therapies that will activate and recruit and activate neutrophils. So so far, most of cancer immunotherapy is focused on very much on the adaptive immune system, such as um, targeting cytotoxic T cells and regulatory T cells by checkpoint blockade. A lot of their, um, developing therapies are studying also to look at other cells of the immune system, like NK cells and also dendritic cells and T cells. But as I mentioned before, very little attention is paid to neutrophil as a target of um, cancer immunotherapy. And I think that should be changing in the next few years. Finally, um, just all that remains is to acknowledge the people who carried out this work. Most of the tumor work was done by very talented um, oncologists and PhD students in my lab, Andrew Yam. Jackie Bailey does most of our imaging, she's our imaging guru, and they were helped by Francis Lin and Arnold Gunn. And previous work on neutrophils was done by Henry Hampton. We're very lucky to have some very cool reporter mice, and our newest neutrophil reporter mice come all the way from Germany. And um, the photoconvertible mice, which I haven't mentioned much in my talk, are a kind of gift from Micho Tomori in Japan, a close collaborator of ours. We received funding from the NHMRC, um, Cancer Institute, and BCF, the Human Frontier Program, and several other funders. Thank you for listening. To unmute. Thank you, uh, Tatiana. It was an amazing talk. Um, and uh, uh, for me, it was a, a big revelation of how we can treat cancer. So uh, maybe I can start with one question and then a very similar question we got from the chat. Uh, do you know is there if there are after, you know, you're saying that you need sustained activation of neutrophils, but uh, do you see maybe that after some time there is a drop of 
neutrophil numbers? Do you have some kind of neutrophil exhaustion after prolonged time? Or if somebody's asking on the chat, what is the lifetime of neutrophils in the tumor microenvironment? We, um, that's a very good question. So we know that neutrophils and circulation are very short-lived. They live for several hours. In tumors, they definitely last for several days. As I mentioned in one of my graphs, but fairly quickly, a single microbial injection will sustain neutrophil numbers over several days, probably three to four days before they start to decline. We do, however, find that neutrophils age within tumors. So um, when you look at neutrophils that are recently coming in and compare them to tumor conditioned neutrophils, we find that tumor conditioned neutrophils lose their ability to respond to stimulating signals. Okay. And I have a last question then in order from the chat. So Hannah Valenta is asking, uh, uh, what do you use to stay neutrophils? Uh, to her knowledge, it's, there, it's very difficult to transfect them. Um, sorry. To how, do you stain, them? How, do you, how do you stain, stain neutrophils? How do you label them? Okay, so as I mentioned, one of the tricky things of working with, that neutrophil, with neutrophils is that they're hard to manipulate. We, um, avoid doing anything to them in vivo. We have a neutral reporter mouse. The, we didn't start out using neutral reporter mouse. The first set of movies where neutrophils were in green were um, using the Lysol MGFP reporter mouse. That was the surprise. We expected that mouse to be a macrophage reporter, but it turned out to be much better for neutrophils. But now we have a Vi6G tomato reporter mouse that was made in Germany. That one is a very cool neutrophil specific reporter that's um, making our life. A lot easier. Uh, Hannah is also asking, is the cytotoxicity of neutrophils due to the ROS production? I think you maybe answered already, but you can very um, um, I kind of implied it. Yes. And we have some evidence from ex vivo experiments it, um, that at least part of the cytotoxicity is mediated via ROS, but neutrophils have a lot of different ways of killing. So I don't think ROS is the only factor responsible. Uh, Mate Kiss is asking, have you checked whether activated neutrophils migrate to the tumor draining lymph nodes? Um, they do. So we also like to look at how long um, immune cells are retained within tumors because that's an important factor in whether they can exert an effect or not. So in steady state, neutrophils will not egress tumors, but if you add bacteria into tumors, then they will migrate into the tumor draining lymph node as well. Thank you. Then we have a question from Takashi. He's asking, is the phagocytic action of neutrophils necessary for tissue remodeling or the molecules they secrete are important? I don't know if it's necessary, but it's kind of inseparable. So as soon as neutrophils come into the tumors in response to staphorase, they will phagocytose it as much as possible and that will kick off the whole antimicrobial program. And that has the side effect of killing tumor cells all around them. Okay, we have a question for last question. How do you differentiate the newly recruited neutrophils from the aged neutrophils? Anonymous. Um, so because that wasn't imaging, I skipped that part. So we also have a photoconvertible reporter. What we do is um, we inject the forest into tumors. So a lot of neutrophils rush in. Then we in the photoconvertible reporter, we shine a very bright violet light on the tumors and that marks neutrophils that are in the tumor at that particular point in time. So later on, we come back and go, as more neutrophils are recruited, we can now discriminate within the neutrophils that were there some time ago and we marked the neutrophils and the neutrophils that just came in in the time since then. And then we can look at the differences in the phenotype and that's a combination of the tumor signaling and the bacteria signaling if we are adding bacteria. Thank you. Philippe is an immunologist again, so it's the second immunology talk of, uh, for today uh, uh, club. Uh, he's uh, heading the, 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 the laboratory at uh, Institut Pasteur, the Department of Immunology and the Dynamics of Immune Responses. Um, he's using intravital imaging for, uh, I would say, for a lot of projects, if not all. Uh, he uh, is trying to understand uh, uh, and, and, and man manipulate immune responses in the context of the diseases and, and pathogenesis in, in particular, cancer as well. 
His lab uh, helped redefine the process of T cell activation in vivo. Um, uh, his work is in the field of infectious diseases introduced to the concept of tissue-wide immunity to effectively control intracellular pathogens. Um, so he's also characterized the cellular interactions regulating CAR T cell therapy. He's also working in the graft rejection field. And please, uh, Philippe, if you can share your slides with us. Sure. Um, is that working? Yes, we see your slides. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here and to be included in this uh, great uh, seminar series. Uh, it was also true uh, today uh, with uh, two fantastic talks. So um, uh, I would like to discuss uh, today our effort in the lab to try to uh, better understand how uh, tumor immunotherapies are actually uh, working in vivo. And of course, this is using uh, uh, intravital imaging. So um, I will just start by uh, stating that if we want to understand uh, the, the fundamental rules uh, that dictate uh, tumor immunosurveillance, or if we want to better understand how these uh, new immunotherapies uh, that are extremely promising are actually working, uh, we need to tackle the complexity of the tumor microenvironment. And that's because the, this uh, environment is full of uh, different cell types. All these cell types are uh, extremely heterogeneous, and I'm talking about the tumor cells, the immune cells, or the stromal cells. So we have now new technologies to uh, uh, try to deconstruct this complexity that include, for example, uh, single cell genomics, uh, that were uh, really uh, um, uh, helpful in trying to get new insight into how uh, uh, tumor immunotherapies are working in vivo. But uh, I will talk uh, today about uh, another approach, uh, which is another single cell approach, which is intravital imaging, as I mentioned already. And that's because uh, a lot of the uh, mechanism that operate in the tumor microenvironment are in fact encoded by a series of very dynamic uh, cellular uh, or molecular events. For example, cells are moving, they interact with each other, they exchange information, they have some uh, transient signaling uh, event or events such as uh, cell division, cell death. So, so if, if we really want to understand uh, the, the whole spectrum of, of, of how uh, 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 therapies working, we also need to capture this dynamic event. And that's why we are uh, relying a lot uh, uh, on this technology, mainly because it offers really a new angle to, to understand uh, these complex questions. I will talk to you about B-cell malignancies, that these are a set of uh, complex diseases and, 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 and diverse diseases with different uh, uh, location, uh, depending on the uh, stage of uh, transformation, uh, but not only, uh, also the, the, the progression of the disease. And that uh, will be also very important in, in my talk. So the first uh, therapy I want to mention is anti-CD20. This is uh, one of the oldest immunotherapies. Uh, and this is the work of uh, Capucine Grandjean in the lab, uh, who's now an in-cell scientist. So uh, just a few words about anti-CD20. So CD20 is a molecule expressed on B cells, and it's also expressed on B cell tumors. And so uh, having this antibody against the, the CD20 antigen uh, has been a major breakthrough for the treatment of B-cell malignancies. It's also turned out to be effective to treat autoimmune disease because it's removing B-cells. And as I said, it, it hacked by depleting malignant and pathogenic B-cells. Now, having said that, and, and despite the fact that this therapy is now in the clinic for uh, uh, around 25 years, um, we still don't fully understand how it works. So what are the mechanism and what, what are the effector cells that are uh, involved? Uh, where is this depletion occurring? Are, for example, some uh, important question. 
there are, uh, of course, a number of mechanisms that have been uh, identified uh, that can contribute to the destruction of tumor by this antibody, such as the, the, the um, impact of the complement, or some uh, um, mechanisms that rely on accessory cells, such as NK cells, uh, that recognize the FC portion of the antibody that is bind to the tumor cells and that can kill tumors. Or again, macrophages that can perform phagocytosis and engulf uh, tumors that are uh, uh, coated with uh, this antibody. So a while ago, we, we studied actually how uh, circulating B cells uh, and uh, circulating tumors were depleted. And what we find is that a lot is happening in the liver, uh, whereby Kupfer cells that you see here in, uh, in green, and this is a, a set of uh, phagocytic cells in the liver, uh, were uh, uh, capable of engulfing the, the B cells that you see in red extremely rapidly uh, within uh, really seconds uh, after injection of the antibody. So that was the really the primary mechanism for removing uh, B cells from, uh, from the circulation. But uh, it's very likely that not all the B cells are actually recirculating. And, and at tumor sites, such as a bone marrow, which is uh, um, a, a typical site for B cell malignancies, uh, if we image the behavior of the tumor cells, uh, this is what we see. Most of the tumor are not uh, moving. Uh, they're uh, not, they don't show evidence for recirculation. So they're very unlikely to be uh, taken uh, um, uh, and eliminated by the Kupfer cells. So there must be some local mechanisms or are there actually some local mechanism operating in the tumor microenvironment? Now to better understand how uh, tumor cells may die after injection of the antibody, uh, Capucin uh, developed a new approach to basically visualize uh, phagocytosis uh, in real time. And she took advantage of the fact that the YFP molecule is really unstable at low pH compared to CFP. So if you um, basically make a tandem molecule of CFP and YFP, when the uh, cell is engulfed in a macrophage, for example, um, then it will, uh, uh, and control low pH environment, and that will result in the sp specific and the selective disappearance of the YFP fluorescence. So this uh, strategy was, was developed so, so we can really unambiguously identify phagocytic event. And this is an example uh, here in, uh, in, a, in a macrophage in vitro that engulf tumor that are coated with the antibody. And you can see that after a while, um, the, um, sorry, after a while, the tumor, the tumor is changing color. <coughs> and we can uh, add a, another layer of complexity because what we can do is to create uh, this dual uh, this, this uh, tandem reporter, but inserting the DVD uh, peptide between the two fluorescent protein. And uh, uh, as a result, when, this, when a cell undergo apoptosis, it will uh, cleave uh, the two, uh, the, 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 this molecule, and, and we will be able also to reveal uh, this cleavage by a change in the fluorescence transfer, and again, a change of color. So with the same reporter, we can basically uh, identify uh, virtually all the cell death events that could occur after anti-CD20 therapy, namely phagocytosis event or apoptosis event that could be, for example, mediated by NK cells. So uh, what we do now is to uh, go in vivo and, uh, and, and uh, use this reporter. Uh, and inject 
uh, really the anti the anti CD20 antibody, uh, and look at the tumor site. And what we can see is really within uh, a minute after injection of the antibody, you see a lot of cells turning blue, so indicating that the uh, antibody is mediating the death of a number of tumor cells uh, extremely rapidly, as you can see, within an hour, there's already a, 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 a substantial fraction of the tumor that, that are uh, dying. And this is uh, just the quantification. So how are these tumors dying? Well, we can visualize uh, uh, other cells, in particular macrophages, and um, what you can appreciate in this movie is that most of the events where the cells change color are actually events of phagocytosis, where you see the tumor cells being captured by macrophages and then uh, changing color. What uh, Capucine was able to show is that the vast majority of the uh, elimination of the tumor were due to this uh, uh, phagocytic event by uh, the macrophage that reside in the bone marrow. Now, we uh, also observe some limitation in this uh, activity. The first one is that the macrophages, as you can see here, are not really uh, motile. Uh, so they can really uh, uh, take care of the tumor cells that are really nearby and the neighboring one. They, don't, uh, they, they are not able to reach uh, long distance. Uh, and you can see that this is conjugated with the fact that uh, when the tumor is growing, there is less and less uh, macrophages in the tumor microenvironment. So they are somehow excluded. And this is the first limitation, most likely because there's not enough, uh, a sufficient density of macrophages. The uh, second interesting uh, uh, observation was that, in fact, this uh, phagocytic event are only happening uh, during the first hour of the therapy. And after that, you can see here, it's really a, a wave. Uh, after that, these macrophages are no longer able to uh, get rid of the tumor cells. And that's uh, certainly very uh, important and I uh, believe has a strong clinical implication. And we need to understand uh, what is driving this hyporesponsiveness after an hour, because we uh, feel that this is really uh, limiting the efficacy of the therapy. So just to summarize this first part, what I've shown you is that in the bone marrow, most of the tumor are sessile and non-circulating. It's really the phagocytosis by the macrophages that are the primary mechanism of this therapy. This is initiated very rapidly but was no longer active after one hour. And uh, it's limited both by the low macrophage density, but also by uh, the, the fact that uh, the, there is a rapid loss of activity, uh, typically after one hour. So I'll switch to the second part of my talk, which uh, are uh, about CAR T cells. <coughs> So this is the work of, uh, again, three uh, very talented uh, uh, scientists in the lab, Morgan Bulch, Marine Cazot, and again, uh, Capucine Grandjean. So CAR T cells, the principle is very simple, at least to explain. It's basically arming the patient T cells with a chimeric receptor that will provide this T cell with the possibility to recognize and to lyse the tumor. And this is a personal therapy because then the, the patient is infused uh, with his own modified uh, T cells. Now, as you probably know, and apply to uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cells, this has uh, been extremely uh, uh, powerful approach with very high remission rate. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, a substantial uh, fraction of the patient relapse. 
So there is really a need to, to, to improve this therapy and to better understand how, how it is working. So there's a lot of uh, outstanding questions when we uh, try to understand this. And these are four of the questions uh, we were interested in. So first, how efficient CAR T cells are actually killing the tumor in vivo? Can we uh, give uh, actual numbers? Uh, what uh, are the functional contribution of CD4 and CD8 CAR T cells? Because in fact, the patients are receiving a mixture, uh, uh, a complex mixture, non-controlled of CD4 and CD8 CAR T cells. So are these subsets uh, completely equivalent in the context of the therapy? Uh, we were also interested in understanding whether the CAR T cells are really uh, autonomous ma uh, killing machine or whether they need some additional interaction in vivo to be uh, uh, working. And finally, uh, and again, how is the anatomical location uh, impacting on uh, the CAR T cell activity? So I'll try to uh, uh, tackle these four questions rapidly. So to address this, we have a, a, a preclinical model of anti-CD19 therapy. Everything is in the mouse, so it's an immunocompetent model with the mouse B-cell lymphoma and uh, mouse CAR T cells. And we again use uh, our fred based reporter to look at apoptosis. Uh, so now we can uh, visualize a tumor that is killed by a color change. So to uh, evaluate the, the killing activity of CAR T cells, we perform intravital imaging directly in the bone marrow, which is a, a tumor site for this model. Uh, and what you can see here are the CAR T cells in green, the live tumor cells are shown in white, and the apoptotic tumor cells are shown in blue. And so if I play the movie, what you see in each of these squares is actually um, a killing event, and you have one on the right, uh, zoom, zoom in, uh, where you see the CAR T cells interacting with the live tumor, and after a while you see the tumor changing color because it undergoes apoptosis. I think one uh, remarkable feature of this killing is that the, despite the fact that these CAR T cells are engineered, to express a very high affinity receptor for the antigen, they detach very rapidly from their target after the killing phase. And uh, in some instances that allow the same CAR T cells to uh, sequentially kill the multiple targets. This is an example shown in the next movie where you will see, uh, I don't know if you see my pointer, uh, but you will see two uh, tumor cells turning blue sequentially uh, after uh, being engaged by your CAR T cells. And again, a very dynamic uh, mode of killing uh, and, and very rapid. So we can be very quantitative with this type of approach and estimate that it took uh, typically 23 minutes from the time of uh, cell uh, uh, engagement, tumor cell engagement, to the time of uh, CAR T cell detachment. And usually a single uh, contact is sufficient uh, to mediate killing. So what I've shown you uh, was, was done with CD8 uh, CAR T cells, so, so how about CD4? As I said, patients receive a mixture of these two subsets. And so, uh, although in vitro, they are both capable of, of killing, uh, we wanted to explore uh, in detail uh, their respective contribution. So basically we repeated the exact same experiment, but we purified uh, uh, CD4 positive CAR, I will call them CAR4 or CAR8 uh, T cells. And really the difference was in the, in the killing uh, uh, ability where, uh, as I've shown you before, the uh, CD8 CAR 
killed by uh, engaging uh, or forming a cell contact. And then you see this color change, uh, typically uh, as I've shown you before. Whereas for a CD4 car, uh, most of the killing occur at distance from the car. So really not during a cell, uh, cell interaction. And this is the quantification of these two distinct modes of killing with the direct mode being really uh, uh, the, the feature of the uh, CAR8 cells. Now in this model, the CAR4 are not very effective and, and you only see a therapeutic eff efficacy of the CAR8. However, if you combine them uh, with, with which I'm not showing you here, but you have an even better response, indicating that the CAR4 are, are probably doing something uh, something else, and, and we wanted to really characterize that in detail. So for this unbiased characterization, we rely on single cell and RNA sequencing just to provide the uh, immune landscape of the tumor uh, microenvironment uh, in the presence or in the absence of CAR T cells. And you can start to appreciate the changes that uh, are happening after CAR4 or CAR8 uh, therapy. So I will just zoom on the effector population, namely the NK cells or the host uh, T cells. And what you can appreciate, this is looking at two cytotoxic genes, granzyme B and perforin, is that the CAR uh, therapy, and in particular the CAR4, uh, is increasing the accumulation of this host effector, the tumor site, and it's not increasing the number, but it's also increasing their activation. As you see, uh, increased uh, expression of granzyme B and perforin one, for example. Uh, we could confirm that uh, by flow cytometry, and you can see that the car uh, uh, are increasing the recruitment of many cells uh, many host immune cells like NK cells, CD8 cells, and it's not only the recruitment, it's also their activation. You can see here looking at granzyme B uh, intracellular content, for example, or so upregulation of uh, MHC class 2 on a monocyte. So it's a broad activation of the host immune system, but um, also um, uh, sorry, so, so first we, we wanted to understand what is mediating uh, this uh, broad activation. We find that the production of interferon gamma by the car was uh, decisive. Uh, so in fact, if we reproduce this experiment, but using CAR T cells that are deficient for interferon gamma, then we lose a lot uh, this uh, uh, broad uh, immune activation by the CAR T cells. So really, the CAR T cells uh, produce production of gamma is, is key in this process. It's in fact also key for the CAR themselves. So if we look at the CAR phenotype uh, in the presence or absence of interferon gamma, you can see that the granzyme uh, B uh, content is decreased in the CAR T cells if the car are not capable of producing interferon gamma. So who's uh, actually, sent, which cell is sensing this interferon gamma? So we repeated this experiment, but this time the recipient is unable to sense the, the interferon gamma because it's, it's deficient for the receptor. And here again, you lose the cytotoxic phenotype of the CAR T cells. So this speaks really to a crosstalk between CAR T cells and host cell, whereby the CAR T cells produce interferon gamma and the host cells uh, respond to this interferon gamma to uh, promote the cytotoxic phenotype of the CAR T cells. So it's, it's nice to show uh, that it has an impact on the phenotype, but does it has a real impact on the function and, and, and again, this is, I want to highlight that this is a really a key advantage of intravital imaging is that we have the ability to uh, actually measure 
directly the killing rate of this car in the tumor microenvironment. And so we can do that for wild type CAR T cells. As I show you, uh, when you do this type of experiment, we see a lot of killing event where a lot of cells uh, being engaged and, and turning blue. But when we do that with uh, CAR T cells that are deficient for interferon gamma, uh, we see a lot of CAR T cells. They are uh, nicely interacting with the tumor, but they are very, uh, 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 very uh, weak at, at killing this tumor. And when we uh, do a quantification, we see that uh, typically they have a five-fold decrease in their killing rate compared to wild-type T cells. Now, this difference in killing rate is translated at the level of survival. You can see that you lose the therapeutic activity of the CAR T cells. If the CAR T cells are not able to produce interferon gamma, or if the host is unable to respond to uh, interferon gamma. So what links interferon gamma to the cytotoxicity of the CAR? Uh, an obvious candidate was IL-12 that uh, has a, a, an impact on cytotoxicity and works uh, often with uh, interferon gamma. And indeed, we could show that uh, the, the presence of uh, 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 CAR T cells increase IL-12 uh, in an interferon gamma dependent manner. Uh, this IL-12 was primarily produced by uh, uh, CDC1, uh, dendritic cells. Uh, and if we use a host that were not capable of producing IL-12, then again, we lose the cytotoxic uh, capacity of the CAR T cells. So overall, uh, uh, what we've shown is that of course, a key function of the CAR T cell is their ability to kill, but that's not the only function. What another uh, key function is the capacity to produce interferon gamma, and this for two reasons. One, because it will activate the host effector, and two, because it will sustain the CAR T cell cytotoxic potential. So finally, uh, I want to say a few words about the anatomical location by uh, mentioning two observations that we've made in this study. One is something that happens very rapidly after the transfer of the car. And this is happening when you have circulating tumors uh, and, and you have high tumor burden when the disease progress. When you have circulating tumor and the CAR T cells encounter the tumor in the circulation, they tend to form cellular clusters uh, and this cluster gets trapped in the lung microcirculation. This is what you see uh, uh, on this image. <laughs> and this is only happening if you have circulating tumors. This has a, a detrimental effect because all these cars are not able to reach the actual uh, interesting site, which is the tumor site. The second observation that I want to mention is that we see uh, 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 in a certain uh, uh, instance relapses in this model uh, with emergence of CD19 uh, negative uh, tumor. This is exactly what's happening also in a number of patients. Uh, what was interesting is that these relapses were happening in the bone marrow and not in the lymph node, possibly because the pressure imposed by the CAR T cell is higher in the bone marrow and favor the emergence of this uh, antigen loss variant. So we ask whether the activity of the car could be different in different anatomical location. And we devise an experiment where we can control or compare the cytotoxicity of the car against the same set of targets, which are B cells, that will be home in different location, but we can quantify the killing uh, by the car in the bone marrow and where you see it's very efficient uh, or in the lymph node and you see that this is really uh, not as efficient. And we uh, believe that that uh, may be linked to the fact that the lymph node express a lot of this inhibitory ligand PDL1 that uh, presumably uh, or possibly suppress CAR T cell activity. And of course, we'd like to speculate that that's 
uh, could be a reason why the response rate of the CAR T cell therapy in the lymphoma is, is, is lower than in the leukemia uh, together with a lower number of or lower frequency of CD19 negative uh, variant. So I conclude uh, just by saying uh, that we have found that circulating tumor can limit the engraftment of the CAR, that a fraction of the CAR is very active with rapid killing dynamics. CAR T cells can boost the host immune response. This is very important if we want to consider combination therapies to limit relapses. Uh, I've shown you that the production of interferon gamma uh, within the tumor microenvironment is in fact a very important function of the CAR T cells. And again, we shouldn't assume that these immunotherapies are working uniformly in the body. There are clear anatomical specificities and this is also true for CAR T cells. And with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for listening. I would like to thank my lab and we'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, what I recommend is now that we ask you a few questions uh, for Philippe and then we will open for all speakers the round table. So we have a question from the chat is the Andrea is asking for the CAR T cells movies uh, without interferon gamma, uh, there was less killing. Uh, it seems that there is a less CAR T uh, mobility. Is that the case? Uh, we have not explored that in detail. It was not obvious from the movie, uh, but maybe we should look uh, more carefully. Maybe the cells are stuck to the with the tumor, uh, but it wasn't something that, that we've noticed. And we have a question from Frank. He's asking, is there any contribution of T-reg cells in, re in, in relapse? Uh, that's a good question. That's something we have not explored. Uh, certainly, we, we have uh, also evidence that the CAR are uh, also uh, decreasing the, the presence of Tregs, so that, that might be also uh, uh, an interesting component. And we have a question from Jackie, but it looks like it's the same as the first question. CAR T cell seems less mobile in interferon inhibited conditions, is that true? So you answered. So two people are asking, you definitely need, <laughs> so need we to really look need to do whether the they are. Yeah, we'll do the you analysis. Have to do. Okay. Um, then I have a question about, uh, can you use the intravital microscopy to actually uh, uh, evaluate or quantify the uh, selectivity of the CAR T cells to have kind of mixed population of tumor and non-tumor cells and see whether they are interacting specifically with the tumor cells and kind of avoiding interaction with normal? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, this is something we have done in uh, other instances, mixing a tumor to understand uh, what is the range of bystander activity, for example. Mm. And uh, I also have a question about your uh, FRET probe for, it's a cleave caspase tree, right? Yes. So I'm just learning recently, like last week, that cleave caspase tree doesn't mean necessarily death that they can, uh, uh, the cells can uh, uh, rebirth from the, so it's not a direct signal for, for dying or so. Can you tell us your opinion? Uh, in, in our opinion, the, 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 this event or the, the vast majority uh, uh, are associated with death because we never see a, a cell survive after turning uh, blue. But of course there are, I mean, the, the caspase, uh, Biology is very complicated and um, caspase tree can also engage other cell death mechanism. Uh, but, but, but in this system, uh, there's no turning back uh, once the cells have been, have turned blue, they, they, they die. Thank you. So there are a couple of questions for Tatiana, so I can read them. So it's from the anonymous attendee. Do you think the new neutrophil depletion strategy would work, uh, for example, using secondary antibodies? I'm not sure what does it mean. So maybe it means something to you. Yeah, there was a recent paper. So neutrophil depletion is problematic for several reasons. First of all, we have a lot of neutrophils, so it takes quite a lot to deplete them. Second of all, um, because neutrophils are so important to keeping us healthy, 
as soon as we deplete them, the bone marrow will replenish them. So those two in combination make neutrals really hard to deplete. And the third reason is what that was identified in the Nature Comms paper by ATN that I think um, this um, question is referring to is that the neutral depleting line antibody does not have the right um, isotype to activate complement depletion. It mostly um, gets depleted by phagocytosis. So I haven't um, had the courage to ask my RS, um, my research assistants to come in every day and inject this antibody in addition to the other antibody that you inject every second day. What I can say is that if you inject just enough of the anti lysis 6G, you can knock neutrophils down, but not deplete them completely. And in my experience, most neutrophil depletion only works well for about a week. After that, you start getting the immune system exhausted. It just can't keep up with all that depleting. And bone marrow is increasing production output of neutrophils. So you start getting some of these um, immature neutrophils coming out in the periphery and they really wreak havoc with your experiments. So we, um, in practice, we haven't been able to, we haven't tried the new method, but I think um, it has the same issue as the previous methods that you can't really deplete neutrophils very efficiently in the long term. What we find helps is um, combining different depletion strategies. So we usually do an antibody mediated depletion and maybe we we'll block migration using CXCR2. And then um, we're thinking that if we really, really want to deplete neutrophils, we might also inhibit their production in the bone marrow. So do a triple hit. Thank you. And then there is another one. Do you see the neutrophils direct interaction with the T cells in the tumor microenvironment? Um, so honestly, we haven't looked at that, but it would be a really difficult thing to look. Um, you've seen how many neutrophils you get after microbial injection. So it's just the sea of neutrophils. So it would be hard to have a definitive no, they don't interact with T cells because they're always in contact with everything. So kind of combining uh, the two last talks, maybe you can uh, combine uh, infection plus the CAR T cells. What do you guys think, both of you? <laughs> Well, that's Elite kind of the ultimate goal, right, to um, stimulate so both arms of the immune system at the same time, so you get the innate and the adaptive responses happening at the same time. That's what you want to do with tumors, hit them from all sides, right? And in your model, uh, uh, Tanya, do you see uh, increased uh, T-cell responses after the, the treatment that you give, or can you measure that? Um, we see increased T cell recruitment and a little bit of an increase in activation. We are trying to combine it with checkpoint inhibitors. We're, we're still working on that. Okay. Tatiana, no. can, I ask, can I ask a question on devil's advocate question? I'm not sure you've touched upon it, but um, you know, you want to play in the pancreatic world uh, and in the breast cancer world and the logistics of actually getting infections to improve um, infiltration. Can you maybe talk to where you see that going or how do you see that translating, I guess? Yep, so at the moment, it's not the most convenient therapy in the world. We have to inject bacteria directly into tumors and frequently. We, um, we're working on ways to get around it. So you could possibly encapsulate Staphorus and have a slow release where continuous activation can be maintained from one infection. Um, Staphorus is also dead. So using live attenuated bacteria can provide potentially a much longer response. We, um, so we have tried it in um, breast cancer is somewhat okay to treat and relatively accessible, I guess. And we, it works relatively well in the breast cancer models that we've tried. We've also tried it in the KPC model of pancreatic cancer. And that one is one of the hardest to treat, but if you um, sustain this long enough, you can. But I mean, obviously in the long term, what we want is to get the adaptive immune system involved. So you have a long term systemic response rather than having to inject into the tumor that you're trying to treat. It also, um, is not a treatment that's particularly good for metastasis. So as a treatment of... strategy, it um, potentially is better as a new adjuvant treatment therapy. Yeah, but there is, there is work out there about the whole microbiome and stuff for pancreatic cancer and how it's related. So, I mean, it does make sense. 
All right, can I ask It's also more? something to consider after surgery. So um, the way it works in bladder cancer is you clean up micrometastasis. So this might be something good to do also flush the surgery, surgical side after surgery to clean up any residual tumor cells. Yeah, 100%. That's what I was kind of going. But um, and I definitely think you can do that. And I definitely think we could quite easily adapt models to be able to do that, to do surgery. Um, and I know people in Melbourne are actually planning on that, where you can actually mimic taking off the tail or mimic taking off the head, depending on if it's um, the type of surgery to mimic that kind of Whipple surgery. Um, all right, so I'll ask another question, and I like to be annoying, so I'm sorry, uh, Felicity. Um, uh, so if I was to say you're very selfish, Felicity, um, you're just working on <laughs> all these amazing asinai and all this biology. There's lots of analogies where you could... Again, I'm just going to jump to pancreas. Surely this, the, the beautiful stuff you're doing there could work in other organs and other tissues. Are you moving in that area or are you selfishly staying in your area? I'm saying the word selfish to kind of try and budge you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I don't know, in, in the, with, a, <laughs> with a relatively small group so far, we have had to, I suppose, other people, the lab has to kind of stop me from playing too much in, in other tissues. Um, and, but now that um, some of the funding um, constraints are off, we, you know, we can start to explore a little bit more. And I think the best way to do that would be collaboratively. Um, we, the, the tissues that we have looked in so far are the models that we can have, the, the tissues that we can have a look at using the models that we have. So when we use K5 to induce the GCAMP, then we, you know, we <coughs> take a look in the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands and, and things like that. And we have an ACT2 model. So we've had a bit of a look in the bladder and, and organs like that. So, and, and epididymis, the, the SMA positive cells in the epididymis. So yeah, we've, when we, when we can, we, you know, do what we what we need to do, and then we play in the other tissues. But in going forward, um, I think that there's there's huge opportunity to to use similar approaches in other organs. And yeah, I'm happy to do so collaboratively. Uh, I can just, ask it. A... Sorry, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I promise to stop talking. But um, Jackie is good at this. Jackie jumps technologies and people and takes a lots of things from one area to the next and. It's that um, kind of unbiased approach that allows you to see stuff that those experts or so-called experts just overlook because they think they know stuff. And I think it's something that if you've got the money, as we all wish we have, it is something that, you know, this community can start to help each other, I think, right? Yeah. yeah so, Felicity, actually, I wanted to ask you, did you look what's happened with the luminal cells and then the, probably you did, and the expulsion of the milk? Or you um, just look, so we, you see the contraction of the, the myopetiliasis, but what's happened with luminal? And what is the, the link between them, the signal? So we had a quick look at the luminal cells um, and it was, it was a, a little bit disappointing at first, but I think we just need to go back and, and use a different model and, and have a look. But essentially what we were hoping, so um, Tanil was actually working on a, um, a, like a, a project where we were focused on uh, mechanically activated ion channels. And so we got interested in the concept that when the basal cell contracts and, and kind of just pushes on that luminal cell, if we had a sensor in the in the luminal population, then perhaps we, we may see activity there. And we did sometimes, but then we didn't other times. And so the data was just a bit, it was just hard to, to figure out what was going on. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so then we also got, there's a GCAMP model that is tethered to the membrane. So then we started wondering, well, if we if we use that model where we have the sensor on the membrane, then maybe we could pick up something a little bit more subtle. Um, and we, I moved before we could make that model. So we had to kind of wind <laughs> down again in order to, to move and then and pick it all back up. But so we, we have had a play. There's also, I suppose, an interesting question as to whether there's a gap junction protein connecting the basal and luminal cells. But, and so maybe that could explain some of the signals that we saw, but, but we couldn't just be, don't have. But maybe, but maybe there is no a signal, direct interaction. Maybe the, the myopetelia cells would just squeeze and then 
induce secretion of the milk from the from those luminal cells by you no know, physical contact, not necessarily biochemical. Yeah. So there is there's work already showing that the that the action of the basal cell helps to push the lipid droplets and get the lipid droplets mm -hmm. out. Um, we have evidence using a knockout model that calcium is involved in in the mm -hmm. luminal population but we haven't been able to visualize it yet. So it's kind of bringing those, those, yeah, those two projects together. Thank you. Very exciting. Yeah, I, had a, I, had a, I can follow up and just two quick questions on for Felicity. Have you tried to inhibit gap junctions in your, in your model? Because you identify connexin 43, but have you gone into inhibition uh, uh, studies to see whether you can impact the... Uh, we haven't. Um, yeah, but, and... So, so I did have, this was kind of, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of, trying a lot of different things in order to get these revisions through. Yeah, and, and so we, we, I had a quick look and I'm not a gap junction person, but from what I could see, I, it, it was hard to find something that was specific and was, and was going to get that for us in that kind of tissue context. So if you know of anything, please, please uh, email me and, and yeah. I'll. Sorry. I'm an expert either, but I know that, that though, actually to move back to the tumor setting, some people will actually developed uh, ways to inhibit, well, I'm not sure how specific this is, but it, it did work in, in the context of glioblastoma progression, for example, or uh, okay. they showed that there was a syncytium and calcium signaling was essential in driving this. So uh, this relates back to the first question also, uh, whether one day you wanna uh, apply this sort of calcium imaging to, uh, to breast cancer progression and, and see where, whether actually calcium is essential there as well. Yeah, so we have plans to, to go into the breast cancer space as well. So I've just hired a, a postdoc to do that here. Yeah. I have one question for for Philippe very quickly. So uh, the, the most uh, was not clear to me which which intravital system you are actually using for the the CAR T cell uh, uh, studies. Oh, oh yeah, all the all the movies I've shown are uh, two photon microscopy uh, in the in the bone marrow. So we oh. image the, the the skull, uh, the bone marrow in the skull. Um, and uh, I was wondering whether you had any plans to move to uh, CAR and K cells uh, rather than, than T cells, for example. Uh, not at the moment. We, we are interested in NK cells because they seem to, uh, to become activated by CAR T cells. So uh, we like to, to study them in conjunction with the CAR T cells. Uh, but we, we have no, no models for uh, CAR and K cells. I mean, there are so many Car, a possible car. We have other uh, candidate for car, but yeah. not not in case. Maybe I have a general question. Ah, go ahead, go ahead. A quick question for Philly. Do you think Tregs stop CAR T cells from killing efficiently? Have you tried them, either visualizing them to see if yeah, they're we, we, we have not, and we should, uh, because uh, their number is modulated by the CAR T cells. So. Uh, one of the good things the CAR T cell seems to do is also to decrease the, the, the frequency of uh, T-Rex. Uh, whether, uh, I think that was one of, of the questions, whether later on uh, the, 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 the T-Rex uh, favor the relapse uh, that, that we haven't looked at. So I think there are multiple cells that would need to be looked at together with the CAR T cells to, to better understand really these cross drugs. That was my follow-up question. Do you think CAR T cells have co-effectors? Like, is there a macrophage wrapped around the tumor cell that's been killed? Have you um, visualized several of them together? So we or maybe CD4 and CD8 T cells? Uh, um, what, what we uh, imagine is that some of the host cells that are becoming activated due to the presence of the CAR T cells may themselves contribute to tumor destruction. And, and uh, it, it's probably not the majority of the killing event, but uh, possibly a, a third of the killing events may occur uh, by cells that are not the CAR T cell. Um, so we, 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 we have, we, as I said, I think it would be very interesting to look at all these cell type in conjunction uh, we're sometimes limited by the number of, uh, of uh, cell types we can look at the same time, but we should make efforts to, 
to make the system even more complicated. Yep, I know how that feels. <laughs> question for Tatiana. You mentioned very quickly at some point that you, in some conditions, were able to observe a, a, a tumor fog. I was not clear to me what you meant by that, like cell debris. Oh, sorry. Yep. So neutrophils kind of form a front. So I had this movie where on one side you have an intact tumor, then there is a front of neutrophils, and what's behind them is just remains of tumor cells that they've um, chewed through that they've remodeled, torn apart. So that's what we call the tumor fog. The tumor cells are being torn into little pieces. So on one side, you have intact, long, big tumor cells. Then you have neutrophils in the middle kind of forming a front into the tumor cells. And what's behind them is just cell debris. So I have one quick question for all of you. So I know Felicity is using a lot of tissue explants. So I'm curious how much Tanya and, and, and the Philippe are using. And can you generally summarize your pros and cons of each? Um, for me, it's easy. We do everything in vivo. Um, as I said, we do cheat by growing our tumors in the ears. But then um, everything from then on is alive and unmanipulated. The only thing we do to tumors is inject bacteria into them and then watch what happens. Um, the cons of that is that um, in vivo manipulation is obviously limited. When you want to block something, it becomes really hard. Like now we're looking at what the, the toll-like receptors involved, how you can block with some tumor remodeling. So that's obviously a lot harder in, in vivo than it is in vitro. We don't hear you, Philippe. Mute. Um, for us, and I think uh, Felicity mentioned that, I mean, we, we have to be flexible and choose the, the best uh, system that will bring uh, the information we want. So uh, when we can do it in vivo, of course, uh, that's, that's uh, better. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, explant, so for example, for us, we've used it a lot to look at lymph node. We, we can collect more information, uh, as it was mentioned. Uh, there are some additional things you can do. Uh, you can put some regent uh, uh, inhibitors and things like that. So, you know, it's really nice to have a, a diverse set of uh, uh, settings and uh, uh, we should also learn from others, uh, you know, how to use these distinct uh, settings. Yeah, so for me, it's definitely nearly everything ex vivo. Um, and, and that's, I think, a limitation for us at times that we want to overcome. But at the same time, I don't want to completely, um, you know, disregard the ex vivo data. It's, it's, it can be a, a really useful model. We can get a lot of data from a single mouse and, as, as far as we've seen so far, you know, it, it, it models what we want to do quite well. So I think it's, yeah, again, using both and, and knowing the limitations of, of both of them as well. For how long, uh, so Felicity, for how long you're keeping your explants in culture? For how long you will see, for example, the, the firing? Uh, about five hours after we've culled the animal. So there's, we, yeah, then, we, then it all goes in, in the bin. Yeah, Daniel. I mean, I was I was interested when I asked for uh, for that I, that question, which was I saw your skin flap, I saw your ex plant. You said five hours. We've actually done experiments where we look at cell cell junctions between ectr and live, and we can actually yes. watch the junctions, the the timing, the movement, everything using frap. Um, when you take an explanted tumor, it's about four hours, and then what we see in vivo disappears a little bit. So we're in the same ballpark. You know, it's this idea of, <clears throat> you know, w w it's great to have a skin flap, but again, that's artificial. And um, Jackie was the one that kind of put me to this, which was, you know, we put um, mice under anesthesia um, and we say, oh, the mouse is alive and it's wonderful, but it's like, it's totally artificial still, right? I mean, <laughs> because that's not how the normal biology works, but at the same time, you have to understand, as Philip said, like you, you need to understand your model, but it is amazing to me that you can still get so many things. If you take a tissue out, it still yeah. functions for quite some time. And some of those really fundamental things like cell cell junctions and therefore gap junctions and stuff that you were talking about would probably be intact for enough. And 
at least you can do loads of experiments. Then when you have to do that one big in vivo experiment, then you've already exactly. done yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's a really good point that you made. I mean, even like, yes, even if we had the optimal setting for intravital imaging, oxytocin when it's released is, is mm. typically released in bursts. So we would still be giving a bolus dose. Uh, you know, we can't have a conscious mouse have see the pups and have that natural oxytocin response. So every model that we have will, will be, will have its limitations. And yeah, so it's about knowing what they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, okay. I think it's two o'clock, so we can- I had one, one last curiosity question for Felicity. In many of the movies, I had really had the feeling that there was a starting point of the calcium wave. The, the starting true, point, I think, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, especially, I mean, I meant. Yeah. The starting point, the first response is artificial because that's diffusion across the tissue. Mm -hmm. Whether when whether there's a site where when a wave generates, it comes, it, I mean, it would make sense that there would be certain sites where a wave would, gen would, would be generated and, and travel from. But that first response is, is us essentially adding our oxytocin to our dish and, and it going across the tissue. Have you done, as Jackie said, I said, I thought the same thing. Um, have you, I mean, we all say we can just pulse the drug in like slowly using those kind of setups and chambers. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at trying that or no? Um, we haven't. And, and and just basically because I haven't thought of doing it yet. But so that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 